11. 11 is the transitional age from Cub Scouts to Weebelows to Boy Scouts. And the big difference between being a Cub and being a Boy Scout is that Cubs are not authorized to sleep out overnight. So when I was 11, <coughs> which was a long time ago, um, we went, uh, I got my first long overnight trip. Now I had the good fortune of joining one of the best scout troops in the state of Texas, which was good because I lived there at the time. And, uh, <coughs> uh, and it was a great troop because the scoutmaster and the assistant scoutmasters were all veterans of the big one. And they, uh, they understood organization. So while a lot of scout troops are involved with hiking, boots and backpacks and going up and down trails and things, we were a mechanized unit. <laughs> <laughs> These other troops, and there's nothing wrong with hiking, they carry their tents on their backs. Little tents for one or two people that you crawl in and out of, you see. We had army surplus wall tents like that with uh, six foot high rig, uh, vertical poles on either end. And you could put six or more cots inside the tent. And we all had, most of us had cots. And most of the cots we had were also army surplus. And the, these are the wooden frames with the X legs and the metal uh, hardware and the canvas bed that you have to stretch to get into place. And you always pinch your fingers when you do it. And I used to wonder how we ever won the war with those soldiers trying to shoot with pinched fingers, but we did. <laughs> and we also cooked as a unit. Now, a troop is made up of patrols. Each patrol has so about eight to 10 boys in it. We had a half dozen patrols in our, in our troop. And one of the assistant scoutmasters had made cook boxes for each of the patrols. And this was a large plywood boxes along the lines of a suitcase in that it was wider and higher than it was deep. And we would carry these to the campsite and attach A-frame legs to it. We bolt them on. Then you fold down the outer side so you have work surfaces to prepare your food. And the part that was inside were now shelves that had your pots and pans and other implements of mess consumption. And we um, had to have a way to carry all that from where we were going to where, you know, from where we were to where we were going. So we had our own troop trailer painted in the troop colors of orange and black with a big black cat on the side and the number 13, which is our troop number, on the side of the cat. And we would load that up. Now, in odd numbered years, we were required to go to the official Boy Scout camp. And where we were, that was Camp Karankawa. Now, for those of you unfamiliar, the Karankawa Indians are <coughs> said to be the only North American cannibals. They didn't actually eat people, but at special ceremonies, they would eat select parts, like the McNuggets or something. <laughs> <laughs> but I joined during an even-numbered year, and we didn't go to Karankawa. We went to uh, Huntsville State Park, which is about 50 miles on the other side of Houston from where we live. We loaded up in a convoy fashion, drove up there. We got to the park and parked on the side of a lake. It was a 200-acre lake, and we were right down on the edge. The, the soil was sandy, the trees were tall. Over to the left, there were the concrete picnic tables. Over to the right, there were the designated camping spots with running water and electrical outlets. And behind us were the bathroom areas. But we weren't going to stay there. That's not why we went. The scoutmasters had made arrangements with the park rangers, and they brought over a little motorboat. And we unloaded everything from the trailer onto the boat in shifts. It was a small boat and we took it across and made amphibious landing on the other side of the lake, <laughs> where nobody ever went. <clears throat> and we, when we got over there, we cleared campsites, we put up the tent, we stretched our, our, out our cots, we pinched our fingers, we uh, set up the cook boxes, and then we got into our swimsuits and we went down to the water's edge and lined up shoulder to shoulder, and with our toes, we moved across the bottom of the water so that we could get out anything that was sharp or pointy, so that when we went down to swim later, Recreationally, we wouldn't get hurt. So we pulled all that stuff out. That night, of course, we slept like logs. Uh, completely exhausted. It was great. People who don't camp much uh, often think about the animal sounds and things at night. We didn't hear any of that. As a matter of fact, during the whole week, the major contact uh, with wildlife was with the, uh, the daddy long leg spiders. Now, I've seen a few around Virginia, but down there they had a lot. 
And for those of you not familiar, it's about the size of your hand, except the body is like a pea, and the, the legs are like little threads. They're practically invisible in the woods. And all spiders can bite, but like most of them, these, these were relatively harmless. But they had one nasty habit. They like to run up your leg you see, when you're least expecting it. Uh, that was the summer I stopped wearing shorts. <laughs> we, um, but now, the next morning was when I found we had two, two major events that morning. And one of them was that I found my role in the troop. It seems that one of the assistant scoutmasters had a, had a, a strange way of cooking, preparing bacon. And he passed that along to the kid who was preparing our bacon that morning. And what, what it consisted of is you take a pound of, of, of sliced bacon, you drop it in a skillet, and you stir it around until the fat turns from white to translucent, and you spoon out the slimy pieces onto a plate, and you call that breakfast. <laughs> uh, I immediately announced to my patrol leader that from henceforth and from now on, I'm going to cook the bacon for you. <laughs> I will cook all the bacon. Uh, the other thing I did is, since the age of three, my mother, whenever she did the dishes, she'd pull up a stool or chair next to the sink and have me there helping her. So I had a lot, many years of experience doing the dishes. And out in the camping trip, I saw that some of the boys' idea was you swish water around in the pot, and then you wipe it out with a rag and you put it on the shelf. And I said, no, 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 no. That's not survival. <laughs> so I didn't do all the dishes, but I did more than my share while we were there. The, um, the second thing, the second big event, like I said, on, on that first morning, was they announced to us that the, some of the older scouts were going to go blaze a trail around the lake so that on Thursday night, after dinner, we could follow that trail and go to the pavilion. And we got to go to the pavilion. We were going to go to the pavilion on Thursday night, and you, you don't look, know what that means. Uh, neither did we. <laughs> and uh, during the week, from time to time, a boy would say, hey, wait, you know, we're going to go to the pavilion Thursday night, and then look around to see who would sit, tell him what we intended to see or do there, and nobody knew. So we'd just say, yay. That was me. <laughs> uh, in between that point and Thursday night, we did make two side trips. The first, one was um, we went to the Huntsville State Prison, which is the maximum security prison <laughs> in the state of Texas. Um, we were promised that we would get to see the electric chair. <laughs> But uh, when we got there, they, they, it was being reupholstered or something. I don't know. It wasn't available. The, the prison, however, was, was very neat, very clean, very quiet, nice place to visit overall. But, you know, we, nobody wanted to live there. Um, and then the, the second trip was to Sam Houston's home, which was uh, sort of a whitewashed log cabin, probably pretty posh for the frontier days. Uh, and I wasn't so much interested in the great man's home as I was in the souvenir shop because this was my first camping trip and I had, did not have a knife to take with me. And in the souvenir shop, they had a little souvenir bowie knife in a sheath with a blade about an inch and a half long, and it could probably cut warm better if you tried. <laughs> but it was a symbolic thing. I was a camper now. I needed to have a knife, so I bought the thing, and I had my little knife. And then on Thursday night, we were going to go right after dinner. And guess who got to do the dishes after dinner? So I'm there scraping the, the pots out when I see the first group forming up to go. And by then, so I redouble my efforts and I'm scraping. They have some tough patches there burned on stuff and you have to you throw in sand or bottle caps or whatever you're trying to get it out. And, and finally I got everything clean, put it back in the cook box, folded up the sides, and I turned around and everyone was gone. I was the only person left in camp. Well, that didn't seem right. <laughs> and I looked up, and the, the sky was kind of a buttermilk color. The sun had gone behind the trees, but the trees were tall. And I thought, there's enough light. They marked the trail. I'm going to go. So I set out through the woods, and I went a little ways. And after a while, I came to a road. It was like a dirt road, actually same sandy soil, it was like a sand road. Um, and I thought, well, this is easier than I thought. I found out later this was a fire road that the rangers used, I guess, in case of fire. And um, I followed the road down, and I went a little ways, and after a while, I saw another boy coming back. And this was Phil. Hey, he had been in my class at school. I knew Phil. Um, Phil had a way of hanging his head that was a 
made him look just slightly goofy, but we were 11. Goofy was a good thing. And I liked him. He had a good heart. And he said he also left after everybody else, and he couldn't catch up to them, so he was going to come back. I said, there's no one back at camp. There's, they've all left. Come with me. I'm going to go. We're going to do this. And he went, OK. And so we came along. We went a little while farther, and we saw another boy coming. This was Pat. Pat had the distinction of being the only person who had been in my class every year since the first grade. They managed to rotate everybody else around. Uh, he reminded me a little bit of uh, Alfalfa from the Argonne comedies, at least in the general appearance. Um, but he was a good guy, and he was going back. He left with the last group and somehow fallen behind. And so he had given up. And we said, no, you know, like the musicians of Bremen or the Wizard of Oz, you know. <laughs> We're going to the pavilion. Come with us. There's no one back there. So he came along with us. And we walked along the road. And we went along the road, having a good time, while the sun was going down. And as the sky began to darken a little bit, the road turned into a trail. And as the sky turned gray, the trail turned into a path. And as it became completely dark, the path turned into nothing at all. <laughs> but we figured it would pick up again. Now, as it happened, I was the only one who had a flashlight there. I had my blue and gold Cub Scout flashlight. Unfortunately, I still have my Cub Scout batteries. <laughs> <laughs> if I held the flashlight like this, pointed down, I could see the ground. If I held it at any other angle, it was completely useless. But it was the only light we had. So we kept going, Figure, looking for the trail. One boy in front would hold the light. The boy behind would have the little knife, because we had to have some protection. And I had the only knife in the group. And that's the way we went, until finally we realized we weren't going to find the trail in front of us. We weren't going to find the trail behind us. So we were going to look for some. So we looked for a little clearing. And I, I reminded them. I said, we can't be lost. We're in a state park. It's an enclosed area. Now, I didn't know it was 2,000 acres of enclosed area. <laughs> but that, that, that didn't change the principle of the thing. And as soon as, you know, we worked it out logically, as soon as they get back to camp, somebody will notice we're not there. And then, probably in the morning, they'll come out looking for us. So all we have to do is settle down and wait. And by the time the sun comes up, we might find our own way back. It's all good. So we sat down. And um, feeling sort of like the leader at this point, I tried to um, get us singing songs. That should be. It didn't work at all. No. Uh, we said a little prayer. They seemed to go for that. <laughs> um, and we noticed an, an airline flying over. Uh, so I, I held up my little light, and I flashed out an SOS. <laughs> if you're ever flying at night and seated by the window, look out. You, you might find some lost boys. Uh, this plane didn't waver. It just kept going. Um, so he told a story or two. And finally, we decided we'd go to sleep. So we got in a little triangle with each of us on our, he our heads on the tummy of the other guy. So we were in a little triangle. And we went to sleep. Now, the troop returned from the pavilion, got back to camp, and sure enough, somebody noticed that we weren't there. And for the scoutmasters, they had lost three boys who had not been seen together. They didn't know they had one group of three boys. They thought they had kids scattered all over the place. <laughs> so they contacted the ranger's office, and they set out to find us. By the time they got organized, it was about midnight. About 4 o'clock in the morning, um, a group that was in one of the boats. They'd come ashore and they'd go in and they'd look a little bit and they'd come back out to the boat. They, they were looking around one time and decided, well, we've done all we can do here. They're calling names and flashing their lights around with fresh batteries. <laughs> and one of the guys before he went back thought, nah, I'll go in a little further. He went in about another 10 feet, waved the light around, and Phil woke up. He picked up my light and said, here we are. <laughs> So they woke me up, and um, we went back out and got in the boat. And we went back, and uh, uh, when they were talking to everybody, the, the scoutmaster was just amazed that we found each other in the woods. And uh, that was, uh, they asked the other boys, you know, were you scared? Did it? 
And they gave me credit for not letting their spirits down and for keeping us together. And they didn't mention that it was my fault they were all lost in the first place. <laughs> and I thought they had been through enough. I didn't want to contradict them and confuse the things. Since then, since then, I have traveled all over the world. I've been camping many times. And uh, I have often not known where I was or how to get where I was going. And my wife really hates to hear me say it at such times, but I've never been lost. <laughs>